or not sure if you were here with us earlier or if you're just joining us. But this is our first live webcast that we're doing from here in the studio, Mike. I think this is amazing that we, we have worked so hard to, to get to the point where we can do this, uh, you know, because things prophetically happen very fast. I mean, you know, we just had a major election last night and, and, and I had felt just before it that we needed to be ready to be in studio today and talk about the economics, what's getting ready to happen there, and to talk about some things about the election and how people need to pray, how they need to be positioned. This is, it's a blessing to have this studio. And we just want to thank those of you who are our par partners and, and who give to generals. You've made this possible and we really appreciate it. Well, uh, last night as I was watching the election results and this morning I got up early to pray and then I, I was praying. I, I, you know, I have to admit my emotions have gone up and down all kinds of different ways about this. and and. Uh, uh, I'll have to tell you as I was driving in before I go back and do a little bit of analysis and kind of where I think we are um, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and it was so strong he said Cindy you're a general don't let the prayer movement rupture over this election yeah. it was as clear as anything I've heard and I thought back to you know when we were fighting for pro-life issues as we've been now and you know God is not a Democrat or a Republican but I'm very, very concerned about the Supreme Court and people think, oh, we lost the courts. No, we haven't lost the courts. We haven't lost anything. You know, because the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. And so, you know, I was really, I mean, I just was flipping my emotions. We started getting text messages, calls, phone calls. And God said to me, remember what happened when the Clintons went in and you know I and I'm, I'm not speaking negatively against the Clintons but I'm just talking about ideologically yeah. we are pro marriage of one man and one woman and we are pro life you know we don't want babies to be aborted I think the stats tell us at least 1500 African American babies a day are being aborted in the segment earlier with Jerry Tuma we talked about how We've aborted 50 million babies that could have paid into social services. Our generation is paying the piper fat. So God said to me, he said, Cindy, get in there and speak to the prayer movement. Speak to the people of God. And, I, and say to them, it is not over. Now, that's very, very strong to say it's not over. Because, you know, when you battle and you pray and you stand, and especially in these pro-life issues, you can really, really be rattled this moment. But I want to say to you, the Lord showed me that there is a demonic oppression of depression trying to come against and panic and fear. Satan wants to scatter the troops. Satan wants to say to you, it's not going to work. It's over. You can't do anything. We've lost the nation. Da, da, da. I just see some people panic, 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 panic. I want to say, stop. Don't do it. Yeah. Don't do it. We can still pull this out. You know, it looks like the plane is going down for a crash. We can still pull this out. Let me tell you some good things. Uh, I have just been on the phone with our friend Jim Garlow who led the battle in California for Proposition 8, which is a constitutional amendment there defining marriage as between one man and one woman. And he said, Cindy, we have won this battle. We have won. He, uh, this was about an hour ago I spoke to him, but he said it's 52 to 48. He said, we're lacking the absentee value, ballots, but we had people vote way early. We're looking at the counties. We kind of know what they're like. So I said, are you sure, Jim? And he said, yes. So if that, if that holds, what does that mean? That means that there will be no more marriages between same sex out of California that are legal. What will that do to the other marriages? Well, he, uh, that, that have already happened, I mean, in the four months. Yeah, isn't that what, 1,100 or 11,000 11, marriages? 11,000 marriages have taken place <coughs> in the From all over, all over the United States. Yeah, because and California will allow people from other states to right. come in and get married there now they go back to their states right and so anyway but but the good news is that th that that we feel that we have won that battle and uh, we've got to still pray we've got to cover it very very carefully see one thing I know about intercessors is sometimes we're very good in short terms mm -hmm. very bad in long terms yeah. and God really began to speak to me he said what if we when we were fighting uh, Hitler 
in World War II, if what if we lost a battlefront, a major battlefront, and as a nation we just said, ah, oh, we can't do that anymore, and just threw up our heads. That's what the Lord showed me it would be like. It's a prayer movement and the prophetic movement. And the believers around the world just said, oh, we're just going to give up. You know, the landscape doesn't look like we want it. I want to say to you, now is the time to stand as we have never stood and pray. Don't tell me you're tired. This is not a time to be tired. This is not a time. I'm speaking to you as a general. We don't call ourselves generals for nothing. I am saying to you and I am speaking to you as the body of Christ. You cannot rest. It is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce Mike and I's good friend, Jim Garlow. Jim Garlow is an author, communicator, historian, brainiac. Oh, that wasn't in there, but it's true. He's very smart. And senior pastor of Skyline Wesleyan Church in San Diego, California. He also hosts two radio shows entitled The Garlow Perspective and The Garlow Perspective Special. We don't know the difference between those two, but he's a strong advocate for biblical marriage. He has probably networked as many pastors for biblical marriage, to fight for biblical marriage, marriage between one man and one woman in America, than any person, at least I know. Let's welcome Jim and Carol, Gar Carol Garlow, my friend and his bride. How about you come up and let them see your face? Let's welcome them. No, Car you don't want to come up? Come on, Carol, let me see you. Power isn't just in us in the church. There's an authority that is in government, there's an authority in arts and media, there's an authority in family. I look at those as seven spheres where God has to raise up champions. Napoleon's maximum is this, the object of war is victory. You know what we do? We get so dumb. We're, you know, we're supposed to be wise as a serpent and harmless as doves. What we end up being is, is you know, dumb as a doorknob and, and lacking the shrewdness we need. When we have elections, when we have victories, short-term victories, we go back and celebrate it like, well, that's it. Here's what Napoleon says about warfare. The object of war is victory but the objective of victory is occupation. We don't win till we occupy high places. The way that governments and nations are formed is minorities of people occupy strategic places of influence and they leverage that influence through leverage within networks that are closely, tightly knit together. The church has to become a kingdom force, leveraging its influence in greater spheres than just evangelism and then linking shields together, I believe, with prayer and fasting, we will see a freshly invigorated move of God in the United States. The, sphere, the seven spheres of influence. Like I say, I'm not the one who came up with this. This has been given by God for, for decades now. But the seven spheres of influence are the home, the church, civil government, business, which includes technology, arts and entertainment, which includes professional sports, education, and the last one is media. Those seven cultural mountains shape a nation. We're the ones called to disciple the nation. And we disciple the nations through those seven spheres of influence. How do we do that? Very practical. Very practical and very simple. Number one, identify the key people in a given community. Let's say San Diego. We've identified the people across the top levels of leadership in those seven spheres of influence and brought them together. And the reason we bring them together is so that they can cross-pollinate each other, encourage each other, and stand together so when one of them is severely tested in standing for the truth of the gospel, others will defend them. The second component, identify young movers and shakers at the bottom of that mountain, young, young people who can be trusted with the kind of authority, and fast-track them up the mountain. The third component of it is to identify the people who are already, already in leadership who are not standing for the truth of Christ, who stand against the truth of Christ, and bring armies of people who are willing to fast and pray and target them that God will touch their heart and either remove them from influence or change their heart to draw them in to conformity with the ways of God. 